Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome everyone, ladies, gentlemen, and non-binary friends to UB Harp's Sexual Health Dialogues. I am Monique Springer, Project Officer with UB Harp, and I'm joined with Ms. Kelia Anderson, our Project Assistant, and Jamal, a technician from UB's Classroom Technology. They will be providing some administrative and technical support respectively for us today. A very special welcome to our students, staff members, off-campus partners, repeat visitors, and to our new guests. UB Harp is the HIV sexual health unit at UE, and we seek to positively influence the sexual and reproductive health and wellness of the university population and the wider Caribbean society. Our primary focus is the development of sexual health literacy among the community through programs such as our digital dialogues. These are informal sexual health conversations and will be held during the semester. They include the S-Files discussion series on a wide range of topics and the SHOCK series, which will focus on sexual health issues among our vulnerable Caribbean populations during COVID-19. You can look out for the flyers on our social media platforms, which include Facebook, Instagram, the UE app, and also through UE emails. There are a few participation guidelines and notices. All mics are muted and videos are off. Q&A will take place after the presentation and the mics will be unmuted as needed. We ask you to post your questions or comments during the presentation in the Q&A chat pod located at the bottom of the screen. We aim to address as many as possible at the end of the presentation. For those questions we couldn't get to, please email them to uweharp at cavehill.uwi.uedu before the end of the day, and we will address them shortly afterwards. The session will be recorded, and the recordings will be posted afterwards on our social media platforms, including our YouTube channel, UWeHarp Cave Hill. These will be done without sensitive personal discussions to protect participants' confidentiality. Please note that we cannot guarantee confidentiality in this public forum among participants. So be cautious about what personal information you disclose about yourself and others. It is safer to talk in general terms. Also, please complete the evaluation form that will be sent to you after the session. You can suggest topics that you're interested in for us to facilitate. We do have a few rules, some of which were adapted from the HIV 2020 online. UB Harp's digital dialogues provide a safe space to address a range of sexual health topics using a sex positive approach. We encourage participants to share their knowledge, experiences and opinions in a respectful manner. You may disagree with views highlighted today. However, please be respectful of other outlooks regardless of your religious or moral beliefs. Let us be mindful in the way we discuss sensitive topics. UB Harp operates on a zero tolerance policy for any kind of abusive, discriminatory, belligerent, or disparaging comments or actions that may cause distress to presenters and or participants. Persons who engage in any undesirable behaviors will be immediately removed from the webinar un unannounced. UB Harp follows the first do no harm guiding principle. Uh, today's topic is living with polycystic ovarian syndrome or PCOS, and it will be delivered by Dr. Courtney Yarbrough. And we're very honored to have her join us today. She is an obstetrician and gynecologist who specializes in the care of the specific gynecological needs of young girls, adolescents, and young women. She has a monthly online webinar entitled Adolescent Health, a gynecological discussion group. These sessions focus on the medical conditions that affect adolescents and young women, such as puberty, abnormal periods, STI prevention, and the HPV vaccine. She also evaluates and manages early pregnancies and their complications, dysmenorrhea, endometriosis, fibroids, and other gynecological conditions. She's dedicated to teaching young women to empower themselves by making healthy lifestyle choices for their present and their future. And then she will let us know at the end how we can support her webinars and to join them um, on, on Facebook and on, on, on Zoom. 
So today we will be focusing, as I said, on polycystic ovarian syndrome, and we will we'll be focusing primarily on cisgendered in individuals. And that is where your sex assigned at birth is aligned with your gender identity. For example, you're born with female sexual anatomy and identify as a woman. We acknowledge that this is not universal as there are some individuals such as intersex, transgendered and other non-binary persons who do not conform to male-female categories. We recognize and honor diverse sexual orientation and gender identities. Polycystic ovarian syndrome or PCOS is a common endocrine or hormonal disorder which affects many women. It presents as a gynecological complication and or morbidity and can be linked to other serious medical conditions. Although it is a common disorder in Barbados, it is still an unknown or silent condition that we do not hear enough about. PCOS is cloaked in stigma associated with many of its symptoms, particularly acne, male pattern hair loss or baldness, facial and body hair, infertility, obesity, depression, and anxiety. Women therefore living with PCOS need access to affordable medical, emotional, and social care and support to cope with the effects of this condition on their quality of life. And we will hear more about PCOS today from Dr. Yarbrough. Thank you, Dr. Yarbrough, for joining us. And we will turn it over the conversation to you. Okay, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate that. Um, welcome everybody again. Thank you for joining me as we discuss polycystic ovarian syndrome. And I will start sharing my screen. Okay, there we are. Okay, so thank you again. We will be discussing polycystic ovarian syndrome as she's already just mentioned. And I wanted to start off first um, with uh, asking, well, discussing the normal period so that we can compare what the normal period looks like compared to what a period will look like with polycystic ovarian syndrome. So first, let's go do a little background and discuss how does your body produce a period. So in our body, we're going to have a little anatomy lesson first. So in our bodies, if you look at the right side of your screen, you see that the, there is a um, brain there that's cut in half. And if you look at this, just for orientation, this is the front of your um, body. So this is where your eyes will be sitting. And this is your, the back of your head. And this is your neck. And if you see here, this insert here they, that they highlighted, there are a couple of organs here that are very, very important in the development of our periods at the very beginning, so for puberty, as well as the continuation of our periods during, throughout our lifetime. So here they have numbered. The first step, the first organ I'm gonna focus on is called the hypothalamus. It's the first area of the brain that is very important um, before puberty even begins. It's here where the hormone GNRH, so you look over here to your left, and it's GRNH and it says gonadotropin releasing hormone. This hormone comes from the hypothalamus and then it talks to this area here. This is your pituitary gland. And this pituitary gland is divided into two different portions. You have the anterior pituitary, which is the orange portion here and the red portion there. And then you have the posterior pituitary. It's in the anterior pituitary where the gonadotropin releasing hormone acts and it causes this gland to produce two other important hormones. These hormones are called LH, or luteinizing hormone, and FSH, or follicle-stimulating hormone. Now, before puberty, the hypothalamus will increase the amount of gonadotropin-releasing hormone to cause these other hormones to be produced. And once puberty starts, these hormones will then talk to our ovaries here. And the ovaries now have a, another picture that will um, highlight the ovary as well. But the ovaries will then produce their own hormones called estrogen and progesterone. And we'll discuss that in a bit detail a bit later. So now let's look at this in a chart formation. So if you, this is here, this is telling you what's happening inside of the ovary here. This level here shows you what's going on with our hormones. So again, you, you have the FSH and the LH that's being produced in the anterior pituitary, and you have the estrogen levels and the progesterone levels that are being produced in the ovary. And then this will show you what's going on at those specific times inside our womb or our urine cavity. And this bottom uh, line shows you the different phases of our period. So when you're in, the, in your brain, in the anterior pituitary, in this first light pink section, 
this is the first day of your period through the last day of your period, and this is your menstruation. During this time in the ovary, you see here that the FSH and the LH are about equal amounts. We are recruiting our developing follicles or our primordial follicles. At that same time, these follicles are producing estrogen and, and progesterone. And again, here you can see they're pretty steady at this level. Once your period is over, you enter the follicular phase and your, the lining of your uterus here is gonna start to become thicker. So you notice during the follicular phase, you have the estrogen level that's increasing slightly. You have the FSH and, I mean, sorry, you have the FSH and the LH that are initially about the same, but there will be a peak soon. And at this time you have a mature follicle developing. And inside of this mature follicle, you have your egg that you will ovulate. Ovulation occurs when the LH or the luteinizing hormone peaks. So you have a LH surge and that causes the ovulation. This is the ovulation time here. And during that time, your FSH does increase slightly. Again, your estrogen levels are higher here than your progesterone levels. The lining of your womb is becoming thicker and thicker. And then once ovulation occurs, this cyst or the follicle where the egg was um, housed at first then becomes your corpus luteum cyst. It is this corpus luteum cyst that is important for the production of progesterone. And it's the progesterone in your body, in your, in your ovary, that will stabilize the uterine lining. And this is very important because once we ovulate, this egg will then go into your fallopian tube here, as seen here, and it will stay here for a few days and it's waiting to be fertilized. If that fertilization does not occur, so now you're in the luteal phase, you have elevated progesterone, you have a thickened endometrial lining, and you have the egg that's waiting to be fertilized. If this egg is not fertilized, then that egg will disintegrate. It will go travel down the fallopian tube into the uterine cavity, disintegrate. The hormones, progesterone will start to decrease because now your corpus luteum is starting to regress. And once the estrogen and progesterone levels start to decrease, that's when you start having your next period as seen on this picture as well as in that picture. So that is a normal menstrual cycle from the very first day of one period to the very first day of the next. And this is what is happening inside your, ov ov your well, your first, your anterior pituitary, and then also inside your ovary. So let's look at a few definitions so we can um, be on the same page. The average age of your first period is age 12. But that's an average. So a lot of the normal ages of uh, your first period actually start between the ages of eight to age of 14. That's considered normal. Your menstrual cycle, as I mentioned before, is from the first day of one period until the first day of your next. And it usually lasts about 21 to 35 days in adult woman. This can be divided, as I showed you before, into two different phases, the follicular phase and the luteal phase. The number of days that the period lasts is more variable though in those first five to seven years after your period starts and in the last 10 years before menopause. So the number of days may change. Now initially, the luteal phase, now again, that's the phase between when you ovulate to when you have the first day of your period, that will remain constant in every woman. That is always 14 days long. It's the follicular phase that varies. So for some women, their, their follicular phase is 14 days and other women is 21 days. And as we become older, closer to menopause, this can change for each individual woman as well. Your menstrual period usually lasts between four to eight days. That's a normal length. And the amount of blood loss that is normal is about 30 to 80 milliliters. And that converts to about changing your pad or tampon every three to four hours. So now we know what's normal. We should look at what's happening when you're an adolescent. So your period has started and now your periods are, are, are here. What's gonna happen? Well, for a lot of adolescents, their periods can be irregular. Again, I said before that in that first five to seven years after your period starts, you can have a different length of for, for your menstrual cycle. And this is asymptomatic and, and actually considered very normal and it's called physiologic adolescent and ovulation. So you have an immature ovarian function that does this, that causes you not to really ovulate on a regular basis. And then the luteal phase is very shortened. So this is very common. And that's why a lot of times you will have um, irregular periods in those first five to seven years. But in about 75% of young ladies, 
their periods are between 21 to 45 days apart in that first year. And then by the time they reach the fourth year, about 95% will, will achieve the regular cycles between 21 to 35 days that are seen in adult women. Now, that said, if your, if your irregular periods do persist into adulthood, that will occur in about one third of young ladies. And the risk of persistence increases if there are signs of hyperandrogenism, which we will discuss shortly. And another key, cycles that are less than 19 days apart or greater than 90 days apart are always abnormal, no matter how old you are. So if you have cycles anywhere in, these, in this range, less than 19 days or greater than 90 days apart, you should be seen by a doctor for further evaluation. We've already said that polycystic ovarian syndrome or an obligatory bleeding can occur and start in adolescence. And this is when polycystic ovarian syndrome comes into play. So one of the, the first definition of polycystic ovarian syndrome is an obligatory menstrual bleeding that is characterized by episodes of having no bleeding at all. You may skip one or two months at a time, or you might have phases where they're either spotting, you spotting more than the, the regular eight days, or I say I should say and or you can have episodes of heavy bleeding or prolonged bleeding and they can actually interchange. So you might have a couple of months where you skip your period and then you might have a month or two where you're spotting all the time and with episodes of heavy bleeding. And this is because and I'll show you a slide in just a second, but the endometrium is lacking the stabilizing effect of progesterone. The endometrial lining that lining that you menstruate from becomes excessively thickened and then they eventually will break down and cause breakthrough bleeding, whether that bleeding is spotting or heavy or prolonged bleeding. So let's look at this from a hormonal perspective. These are two different slides here. The first slide, this down one and down here is your regular ovulatory cycle. So you, as I showed you before, you can see that this level, the black line is progesterone and the dotted pink line is your estrogen levels. This is the first day of your period. This is ovulation. And you see here after ovulation, your progesterone increases. And this is during your luteal phase. So you see a biphasic increase in estradiol or estrogen, and you see that monophasic increase in the progesterone. And with the decrease of both the estrogen and progesterone, as I mentioned before, you have your period. But in young ladies and women who have an ovulatory cycles, you see here that they do not ovulate. And if they don't ovulate, if they don't have that that peak of the progesterone. So there's no progesterone, but you still have an increased level of estrogen, even though it's not in that regular biphasic um, pattern. During this elevated estrogen level, this when your endometrial lining that you menstruate from becomes thicker and thicker. So there's no ovulation, there's no luteal phase, and there's no progesterone. And it's eventually once that lining becomes so thick, you can have a disordered period that may be extra heavy and extra long. So the definition of polycystic ovarian syndrome includes two characteristics. First, you have the irregular periods that are due to ovulatory dysfunction, and you have signs of hyperandrogenism or elevated testosterone levels. And this can be either clinically, that I, can, that I see physically during your exam, or through a lab test. Polycystic ovarian syndrome is the most common cause of hirsutism, Amenorrhea, which again is no period. So if you're skipping one, two, three months, that's amenorrhea. Most, and it's also the most common cause of inovulatory bleeding in women. But unfortunately, the cause of PCOS is really unknown. We do not know why women get it. And we also don't know why it's so prevalent. But we do know that it's common in families. So if you have a mother or a sister or an aunt who've had, who've had issues with their periods, their periods are ir irregular, or they've had issues trying to become pregnant, they have infertility issues. We talked about the fact that polycystic ovarian syndrome is a very challenging diagnosis, and that's because it's a diagnosis of exclusion. But let's look at some of the clinical features of, um, of um, polycystic ovarian syndrome, some of the features that we use actually to diagnose it. So again, I mentioned that to diagnose polycystic ovarian syndrome, you have to have irregular periods, as well as signs of hyperandrogenism. Excuse me, I'm trying to catch up breath. I apologize. So, <clears throat> hirsutism. Hirsutism is the abnormal amount of sexual hair that appears in a male-type pattern. 
So if, I don't know if you can see this picture well, but you can kind of look at this scale here. This is called the theremin galway system, where we look at all these different areas of the body to see how much hair growth is present. And if you, and each level has a number. So we look at, we score a young lady during her exam to see how much hair growth she has. And if in the, in the United States, the cutoff score is greater than or equal to eight. So anything that is greater than or equal to eight, she would be considered her suit. But the score does vary with ethnicity, as you can imagine. So women of Mediterranean, Hispanic, and Middle Eastern descent, their score is a little higher because they are naturally um, more hairy. So a score of greater than or equal to nine to 10 is considered abnormal. And then for Asian women, a score of greater than or equal to two is actually considered abnormal. So getting the patient's um, family history and their ethnicity history will be very important during your evaluation. But keep this in mind that women who are hirsutes, 75 to 80%, even though there are other causes of hirsutism, 75 to 80% of these women who have are hirsute, it, it is caused by polycystic ovarian syndrome. So it is rather common actually in the condition. Another way that the hyperandrogenism can show is through acne. And you know, I see a lot of adolescents, so looking at acne is very common, but you should still look at it very closely to see what type of acne is present. The kind that is associated with the polycystic ovarian syndrome is the inflammatory kind. And those would be here, like the ones that are very red. So the pustules, the nodules, the papules, those are the ones that are considered inflammatory acne vulgaris. And in order to diagnose a patient with uh, polycystic ovarian syndrome, she would have to have a level of moderate to severe acne. And this would be greater than 10 lesions, either on her face, chest, uh, shoulders, or back. And some of these young ladies also, and usually it's not adolescents, but as an older woman, if the polycystic ovarian syndrome will persist, they can develop a pattern of balding. Now I show you this picture so because women who actually lose hair, they usually lose hair first in the middle. If you if you um, split your hair down the middle, they would lose hair in the middle and it would then spread out toward the sides. But men tend to lose hair in the front and in the middle of the back first. So if a, you see a woman with this type of hair loss, then you can also consider polycystic ovarian syndrome in her as well if it has not already been diagnosed. Obesity is very common with patients with polycystic cystic ovarian syndrome. But interestingly enough, it is present in is up to half of the patients. So half of the patients with polycystic ovarian syndrome will not be obese. It's, it is not a diagnosis that is necessary, but it's a clinical feature. So the, the obesity that is associated with PCOS is the central type, and I showed you a little drawing here, meaning the abdomen is enlarged first, and the waist cut circumference is greater than or equal to 88 centimeters or 35 inches. And we also measure your weight. So obesity technically is a body mass index or BMI of greater than or equal to 30 kilograms per meter squared. We're comparing your weight to your height to get this number. Another feature that I see actually very commonly is acanthosis microcans. It's a skin condition. You can see it at the back of the neck here on this young lady and in the armpits there. It's a velvety darkening of the skin. And this is very important because this is an indicator of insulin resistance, which is um, part of what we call the metabolic syndrome that's associated with polycystic ovarian syndrome. It can usually, but not necessarily be accompanied by obesity. And it may be the first sign of PCOS that you see. So if you see a young lady with this skin condition, but her periods are still regular, you may want to continue to monitor her over time because her periods may become irregular in the near future. And then we have the classic appearance of the polycystic ovary on ultrasound. So if you look at the drawing, you can see how the recruitment of the follicle turns into a dominant follicle and ovulation. But with polycystic ovaries, they keep trying to recruit a dominant follicle and an egg, but it just cannot do it. There's a misstep there somewhere. We don't know what causes it, but it keeps trying to produce these eggs and you have multiple small little follicles in the periphery of the, of the ovary there. And this is what an actual ultrasound looks like. And you, you may have, the radiologist may tell you it looks like a string of pearls. That's a common symptom or sign of polycystic ovarian syndrome. 
But again, the ultrasound picture is not a diagnosis. You do not need that diagnosis, or you do not need that picture to make the diagnosis of PCOS. As I mentioned before, PCOS is a diagnosis of exclusion, meaning that you have to consider other causes of irregular periods and uh, hyperandrogenism. And the reason for this is because the treatment modalities are different. A lot of times, if irregular periods are caused by another condition, the medications that you use or the treatment that you use will be completely different, and the periods will go back to normal once they are treated appropriately. So you cannot assume a patient has polycystic ovarian syndrome until these other conditions have been ruled out. So first, the common symptom is the, the common diagnosis is physi physiological adolescent anovulation. Uh, again, this is during um, adolescence only though. So after those first five to seven years, if it still persists, in the, it persists then it's polycystic ovarian syndrome. But you should always check for a thyroid disease like hypothyroidism, premature ovarian failure, which is when you stop uh, menstruating altogether and you go into early menopause before the age of 40. So you're having irregular periods because you're no longer uh, ovulating on a regular basis and you're actually entering into menopause early. Uh, you can have hormone producing ovarian cysts as well, as well as a rare adrenal tumor. Now put those two together because that is the real reason for the ultrasound. You're doing an ultrasound to look for the ovarian cysts and an adrenal tumor that may cause the irregular periods. And then there can be some genetic causes as well, something called non classical congenital adrenal hyperplasia and Cushing syndrome. Pregnancy, and I probably should put this number one because whenever a young lady walks in the door and she hasn't had a period for two to three months, the first test I will do is a pregnancy test because that is actually going to be more common than anything else. And then we also check the prolactin levels to check for hyperprolactinemia. So an elevated prolactin level can actually make your body think that you're pregnant or that you just had a baby, and that will stop your periods from coming. So when you go in for evaluation, we first take a medical history, your history of your present illness, which includes your age of first, your first period, and how your period was at that time, how your period is now, so your menstrual pattern at the current moment, and how it, how it changed. So how did it progress from where it was before to where it is now? We also will ask you about any um, shaving. Do you shave quite a bit or do you have a lot of acne? Do you use medications for acne? Do you use any kind of uh, depilatory creams that will take remove the excess hair? What medications are you taking? Because there are some medications out there that will cause excessive hair growth. So are you taking valproic, valproic acid for seizures or are you taking steroids for some other condition? We will look through your medical and your family history as well as take, check your med medication history. And we will look for physical signs of your height, weight, your BMI, acne, as well as um, signs of hirsutism and, and acanthosis macrocans, as we talked about before. And then when we send you to the labs, these are the set of labs that we will get initially. So on, this, on the slide that says primary, this is the first set of labs that we will check. We are looking for, if there's no clinical signs of um, hyperandrogenism, we will definitely check a free and total to, or total testosterone to see if there's a laboratory sign of elevated testosterone levels. We will check a beta HDG, which is a pregnancy test. We'll check the uh, FBC or the um, blood count and the CMP, which is your metabolic panel. We're looking for signs of anemia or any other kind of chronic medical condition that can affect your period. Your FSH, again, is the follicle stimulating your hormone that causes recruitment of the follicles in your eggs. And if this number is elevated, they may give us a sign that you have premature ovarian, um, premature ovarian failure. We'll check the uh, LH as well and look for the ratio of FSH and LH because if there's an elevated ratio, then there's an increased risk also of polycystic ovarian syndrome. Prolactin, I've already mentioned, elevated prolactin, your body thinks you're pregnant, and then the, the TSH checks your thyroid. Now, if all of those um, lab tests are normal, but I still have a strong suspicion that something else is going on, it's not necessarily polycystic ovarian syndrome, then I will um, check you for a, these other tests in the secondary section. The early morning 17 hydroxyprogesterone is actually a test that is taken at 8 a.m. before you eat anything. And that's checking for what we call that non classical congenital adrenal hyperplasia that I mentioned on the slide before, that genetic disorder. Progesterone levels, day, and specifically day 21 progesterone, will let me know whether or not you're ovulating on a regular basis. 
because during that luteal phase, again, progesterone increases. Serum cortisol levels will check for Cushing's disease. DHEAS is an antigen that is produced in the adrenal gland. So that will let me know, or give me a clue whether or not you may have an adrenal tumor. And then as we mentioned before, the ultrasound to refer to ovarian cysts and the adrenal tumor as well. And then it may also show us polycystic ovaries. So the diagnosis of PCOS, as we mentioned before, your regular periods with hyperandrogenism and you have your diagnosis. And you have ruled out all those other conditions that I've just mentioned. But this is a, a key caveat I wanted to mention to everyone because I see this quite often. I see a lot of referrals in my, in my office telling me that the lady or the young lady has polycystic ovaries because of what is seen on ultrasound. But she has a regular monthly periods that are not heavy, that are not prolonged, and she has no other issues with the period. She does not have polycystic ovarian syndrome. You must have the irregular periods and the signs of hyperandrogenism to have the diagnosis of PCOS. The ultrasound does not diagnose you with polycystic ovaries. All right, so now you have the diagnosis of polycystic ovarian syndrome, what next? So before we start talking about treatment, it's very important to talk about the associated risk factors for polycystic ovarian syndrome. One of them being what I mentioned before, is a metabolic syndrome. Young ladies are at increased risk of developing cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and dyslipidemia because of their polycystic ovaries. This results from the interaction between insulin resistance with their being obese and as they get older and increasing in age. So you have the insulin resistance that causes glucose intolerance and it can lead to type 2 diabetes. You have an increased risk of hypertension and you have an increased risk of dyslipidemia with elevated cholesterol levels, elevated triglycerides and low high density lipoprotein or HDL. And HDL is a good cholesterol, so you want that number to be normal to high. So if you find three or more of these findings, then you have a high risk of developing cardiovascular disease later in life. And interestingly enough, I mentioned before that PCOS is, does run in families. So if a young lady has PCOS and their first degree relatives, their sisters, their parents have not been diagnosed with diabetes or hypertension or dyslipidemia um, in the past, they should be evaluated if they have not been done so before because they also have an increased risk of developing these conditions. Uh, these young ladies also have an increased risk of what's called sleep disordered breathing. And again, this is mostly due to the obesity in relation to the polycystic ovarian syndrome. It can lead to obstructive sleep apnea because of the extra adipose tissue around the neck that when they're sleeping can put pressure on their trachea or their breathing tube. This will lead to reduced sleep efficiency and poor sleep, where they can be very drowsy and tired throughout the day and not really functioning at a normal level because of their fatigue. The severity of this disorder is correlated with the number of features of the metabolic syndrome as well. So if they have diabetes and hypertension on top of this, it can be worse. And they have an increased risk of depression, anxiety, and other mood disorders. This can be due to either a distress with the body appearance or just the mere fact that their periods are so irregular and it's, that it's unpredictable is impairing their quality of life. And of course, once they're ready to start having a family, if they start having difficulty having a family, then it can cause depression and anxiety as well. And one other uh, associated risk factor is the fatty liver, excuse me, the fatty liver. Um, there's an alcoholic version and a non-alcoholic version. This is a non-alcoholic version, and this can cause an increase in their liver function test. And this test is um, checked during the metabolic panel, so uh, this will be very important as well for their uh, future uh, medical conditions. And last but not least, um, I, well, I know that you guys talked about infertility last week, so I'm not going to go into details of infertility. But infertility is the most common cause, no, sorry, PCOS is the most common cause of infertility um, in women. But because of this disordered um, ovulation, not ovulating, and you have the um, elevated levels of estradiol and estrogen exposure to your lining of your uterine cavity, you then also have increased risk of developing endometrial hyperplasia, which is an extra thickening of the endometrial lining. And if this becomes very disordered with disordered growth and abnormal cell development, it could lead to endometrial cancer down the road. 
So it is very important to get this under control as only as possible as soon as you have a diagnosis. So with the um, metabolic syndrome, this can start, this starts in adolescence in about 25% of the time. So at each visit, you should check their blood pressure and, and their weight and height to see if they have decreased their weight um, and to see if their risk of cardiometabolic risk factors have increased. About every one to two years, they should have a fasting lipid profile and also a diabetes test, which is a two hour glucose tolerance test or a fasting glucose with a hemoglobin A1C. And again, remember to check their first degree relatives as well. So let's briefly talk about their treatment of PCOS. So the treatment really depends on the goal of the patient and their symptoms. So if it's an adolescent versus a young lady who is start, ready to start her family, the treatment may differ, the initial treatment may differ. So usually the first line therapy is some kind of hormonal treatment. And if you want a young lady who wants to have um, pregnancy prevention as well, then we usually recommend combined pills that have both estrogen and progesterone in them. The combined OCPs will correct their menstrual irregularities, protect them against pregnancy, protect them against developing individual hyperplasia and the carcinoma, and decrease their androgen levels. The decreased androgen levels can then address the progression of any carcinogen that they may have already, which will reduce, reduce their need to remove their hair by shaving or depilatory methods and improve their acne within three months. But there are some young ladies who just cannot take a combined OCP for a variety of reasons. It's usually because of the estrogen component. Maybe they've had a history of blood clots in their legs and lungs. Maybe they've had a bad reaction to the um, combined pills in the past. Maybe they have a, had a history of some kind of um, estrogen dependent cancer, such as breast cancer or ovarian cancer, then a combined OCP would not um, be recommended in these patients, in those persons. So you do have the option of progesterone only medications. Um, they would include the um, depilatory injection, the tablets that you can take every day, the progesterone only tablets you can take daily. And then you can also take the progesterone tablets on a cyclical basis, so 10 to 12 days out of the month. If you decide to take, the, or and also the Mirena IUD. If you use the uh, Depo-Vivera injection or the Mirena IUD, those two are contraceptives as well. So you will have the added benefit of protection against pregnancy, as well as protection against um, your endometrium from hyperplasia and endometrial cancer. But with any progesterone medication, you will not have regular cycles. Usually your periods will either stop altogether or you may have unpredictable spotting or bleeding in between, but usually not to the level as if you were having just the um, PCOS bleeding without any medication. Progesterone only methods also will not treat the hirsutism. So if your main concern as well is the hair, um, the hair growth, then you may have to take or use another form of treatment or medication to correct that. So just for her treatment on its own, you can use cosmetic treatments such as waxing, plucking, shaving. Um, there are depilatory creams for removal of the hair. Um, you can com combine this with an oral contraceptive tablet um, and you can combine it also with an anti antigen medication that will inhibit the binding of the antigen to a receptor, thus you won't have a hair growth. If there is evidence of abnormal glucose tolerance or lipid abnormalities, the medication then that is first line is called metformin. And metformin is actually a diabetes medication. And it was found um, that it had the secondary benefit of regulating periods. There are a lot of women out there who were di was diagnosed with um, irregular periods. They had not been diagnosed with polycystic ovarian syndrome yet, but they also had diabetes. And they were put on this medication and lo and behold, they started to lose weight, some of them, and they also uh, started to have regular periods on this medication. This is not a contraception, so it will not prevent pregnancy, but it can be used in combination with the contraception. It can be also be used alone if you don't want to take a hormone with lifestyle measures, and it, can, and it works by lowering the insulin level for reducing hepatic glucose production. Hi, Dr. Yarbrough. Oh, changes, yes. 15 minutes left. Okay, thank you. The lifestyle changes that I just mentioned are really weight reduction because there has there have been evidence to show that if you lose about 10 to 15% of your weight, you probably will show some benefits for your periods coming more regularly and some reproductive benefits. Women who have lost the weight show find that they ovulate more often and they can get pregnant easier. 
Um, the weight reduction methods would be diet and exercise. And a lot of times I will discuss this with my patients initially. And then after a couple of visits, if I re realize that they're still struggling with diet and exercise, I will refer them to a dietitian to be put on a diet plan. I find this is a very beneficial for many of my patients. Um, the lifestyle changes will improve, again, the insulin resistance, so your risk of diabetes will go down, as well as the hyperandrogenism symptoms of hirsutism and acne. And then again, you can use metformin actually to help you with infertility, like I mentioned before, in combination with population reduction methods uh, and medications. But keep in mind too, that infertility of PCOS is relative, not absolute. Women with PCOS do ovulate from time to time. So if you are not ready to be pregnant, then I do recommend using some form of contraception, whether it be a combined OCP or um, a progesterone only method, such as the IUD or the shot. The treatment goals for ladies with polycystic ovarian syndromes, again, depends on their individual symptoms, goals, and preferences. Uh, many of them do prefer to treat their hypoendrogenic features, um, manage their underlying metabolic, metabolic abnormalities, and reduce their risk factors of type 2 diabetes, hypertension, and dyslipidemia. Also, the goal should be to prevent the development of endometrial hyperplasia and carcinoma, provide contraception to those who want it, and to aid in ovulation induction for those who desire. When should you see a doctor in all of this discussion? So I wanted to focus on this so that you, we can break this down. So if your period has not started by the age of 14 and you've had no breast development, your period has not started by the age of 16 with prior breast development, you're skipping more than one month at a time repetitively. So you may skip one month every blue moon and that's fine, but if you're skipping more than one month or it's more than 90 days apart or less than 19 days apart, if your period is lasting more than a normal seven to eight days, if you're changing your period, your pad, your tampons to less than every two to three hours, or if you need to wear more than one sanitary product at a time because of the excessive heaviness of the bleeding, you should be seen by a doctor before the evaluation. Don't wait to see if you get better on its own. All right, that was the end of my presentation. I just wanted to put this uh, screen up to let you know how to contact me if you have more questions. I do have um, have one-on-one -on -one online Zoom medical session, but if you prefer to be seen in person, I have clinic appointments at um, Barbados Family Planning and at JRB Medical Center in Belleville. And thank you so much for listening. Um, I also, oh, I did want to mention, I do have a little help in GYN discussion group on a monthly basis. Um, the next one is coming up on this Sunday, the 25th, and that topic will be sexual transmitted infections. And if you are interested in that, I will give that information over so that you guys can um, join in. But briefly, you can join in by uh, signing into eventbrite.com and just Googling or searching my name and it should pop up and you should be able to join in that discussion. Thank you guys so much. Great, thank you so much, um, Dr. Yarbrough. That was a really good presentation. Are you hearing me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, great. That was really, really good. Um, I know that there are a couple of questions and I also um, acknowledge that you have to leave um, in a little while, 2.15. Yes. Um, so um, I, as I told you, I have a few questions, but I'll just ask one and see if the others then will, um, will ask my question as well. Um, with regards to... Um, the obesity caused by PCOS. I just need some clarification on this. And if this is a hormone related obesity, can you control um, the obesity or manage the obesity uh, without taking um, any medication or stabilizing the hormone levels for PCOS? Well, um, you, with the obesity, we don't really know which comes first, right? It's like the cart for the horse, the egg, the chicken. We don't know if it's the obesity first or the PCOS. We okay. do know it's a common feature of polycystic syndrome for sure. And we there's also been research that has shown that with weight loss, you can correct a lot of the features of polycystic ovarian syndrome. So um, correcting it would be mostly weight reduction and then lifestyle changes with diet and exercise. So decreasing the weight that way will actually kind of stay, will stabilize the hormonal 
um, imbalance in some women. I can't guarantee okay. that because there are okay. half of the women again aren't obese, right? Half of them are okay. obese with PCOS. So okay. I will correct it for some women. Okay. Sometimes you may need extra help with medication. Um, but the medication really is to prevent the excessive bleeding and prevent the formation of endometrial hyperplasia and endometrial cancer. Okay. Because I was wondering then how, how it would be possible to control the obesity uh, with PCOS if you couldn't control it before without being on medication. So um, that was my, my first question. But then I'll let Kelia field the other questions to you and then I can always come back to my question um, if we have time afterwards. Okay. Thank you so much for that response. Thanks, Monique. Um, we have about five questions here, and that was a really good presentation, Dr.